Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. May I have your attention? In the next few minutes, if you can just settle down, we will shortly have a, the talk by Dr. Sanjay Baru. Good evening, uh, Jayant. We were waiting for you. Now that you've arrived, I can start. A very hearty welcome to all of you. It's wonderful to see you here in Pune, particularly our guests from outside Pune. We kick off the Pune Dialogue for, on National Security, which is our annual flagship event of the Pune International Center, which we uh, do in cooperation and with uh, very close cooperation with that with uh, the Policy uh, Perspectives Foundation of New Delhi and uh, Center for Advanced Strategic Studies, which is in Pune, based in the Pune University. So it uh, gives me great pleasure to welcome you. Um, unfortunately, Dr. Sanjay Baru couldn't be present here in person. Uh, just a couple of days back, he unfortunately had a very severe attack of rheumatoid arthritis and he was in very severe pain, he was advised not to travel. Of course, when you see him on the screen, you will see he is looking quite sprightly, but uh, he is almost forcing himself and he said I could, I could last out for that half an hour that he will be speaking. Uh, thereafter, I have to go and lie down and take my medicine again. So he has been very brave about it. So. Um, um, I convey his apologies for not being present in person. The, the only thing I think we'll lose out is the personal interaction with him. But uh, other than that, you'll find that um, uh, he, he's more or less, uh, you know, live and up, up and uh, uh, up close and clear uh, as much as he would have been otherwise. Uh, most of us have known or heard of him, I'm sure. Uh, he's a political commentator and policy analyst. S he served as the Secretary General of Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce and Industry, FICI, until he resigned from that post in 2018. But prior to that, he was Director for Geoeconomics and Strategy at IISS, the International Institute for Strategic Studies in London. Um, but I think most of us know him more as the media advisor to Sri Manmohan Singh, the Prime Minister, from May 2004 to August 2008. He has also served as Associate Editor at the Economic Times and the Times of India and the Chief Editor at Business Standard. He writes a regular column for Civil Society magazine called Delhi Darwar. I think that that uh, is more or less uh, a, a short brief on his achievements. He has many more. Uh, without further ado, I'd uh, uh, start his, uh, his uh, talk. It'll take about 30, 35 minutes, uh, after which, unfortunately, there's no Q&A because he's, uh, he's not available. But I hope you enjoy his talk. Thank you very much. Good evening, um, Dr. Kailkar, Dr. Marshalkar, General Patankar, ladies and gentlemen. I'm extremely sorry for not being uh, with you in Pune this evening. Uh, health did not permit me to travel, but I'm grateful to the Pune International Center for arranging this recording so that I can share my thoughts with you uh, at this conference of yours. The subject I have chosen uh, to speak on um, is titled Revisiting the Strategic Consequences of India's Economic Performance. I call it revisiting uh, because about 20 years ago, I had written an essay uh, on the strategic consequences of India's economic performance. And I'm taking a relook at some of the ideas uh, that were presented at that time to the National Security Advisory Board, of which I was then a member. 
I'm grateful to the Pune International Center for bestowing on me this honor to deliver this lecture as part of the Pune Dialogue on National Security 2022. Since my talk stands between you and your dinner, I shall not make it too long. It is not often that an economist is invited to speak at a dialogue on national security. The professional worlds of economic policy making and defense and national security planning have largely remained apart despite the fact that over the past 75 years, successive governments have defined India's core foreign and national security policy priority to be her economic development and an improvement in the well-being of her people. It is not altogether surprising that despite the border clashes with Pakistan and China in 1948 and 1962, there was no medium to long-term thinking on defense expenditure and armaments manufacture as part of India's five-year plans. The Planning Commission did not find the need to induct relevant expertise to draft a medium-term defense plan. And so investment in defense capability and national security did not get much attention from economic planners. The focus in the early years was on development at home and diplomacy overseas. With the average annual rate of growth of GDP around 3.5% and per capita income growth of 1.4%, in the period 1950 to 1980, the revenues generated were barely adequate to address the development priorities of the plan. Allocations for defense and national security became demand determined and episodic. The episodic manner in which governments dealt with these demands is evidenced by the fact that spending on defense went up for about two to three years after every war that is the 62 war, the 65 war, and the 71 war, and then went down till the next war. So you can see the data shows a spike in defense spending, 62, 63, and then again 65, 66, and then 72, 73. But it returns to a kind of a low level equilibrium over a long period of time. This was of course understandable, given the low level of national income, the consequent limited fiscal capacity of the state and increasing demands made on the exchequer by development and welfare oriented spending. Unhappy with this state of affairs, a junior officer in the Ministry of Defense proposed in 1977 that a five year plan for defense be drawn up. The officer, the late Mr. K. Subramanyam, a strategic policy analyst that most of you who are familiar with, was tasked to produce the plan. After much hard work and consultations with the three services and relevant ministries, the young Mr. Subramanian produced a plan. The Union Cabinet Committee on Security met to discuss the plan in November 1977. As luck would have it, the day before the meeting, the Prime Minister Morarji Desai narrowly escaped death walking away from a crashed helicopter in Assam. Next day, he arrived at the meeting of the CCS and narrated in detail what had happened to his colleagues, the Defense Minister Jagjivan Rao, External Affairs Minister Atal Bihari Vajpayee, and Finance Minister H.M. Patel. By the time all of them expressed their gratitude to the Almighty, the Cabinet Secretary Nirmal Mukherjee informed the Prime Minister that he had another meeting to go to. So the Cabinet Committee on Security meeting ended without any discussion of the first ever five-year plan for defense. A disappointed Subramaniam approached the Cabinet Secretary, seeking a rescheduling of the CCS meeting. Not necessary, Mr. Mukherjee told Subramaniam. The CCS met. No one objected to your note. So you can draft the minutes saying the CCS approved the plan. And that was the last that was heard of the first and the only five-year plan for defense. And nothing happened after that. Incidentally, this is a, a story narrated to me by Mr. Subramaniam himself. Well, anarchism continued to define defense planning and budgeting, and does so even now. The economic and political crisis of 1991 forced the political leadership 
to take a more careful look at the links between economic growth, fiscal capacity of the government, national defense and security. I have discussed in some detail the interrelationship between the economic and foreign policy choices India was required to make in response to this fiscal and balance of payments crisis of 1991 and the implosion of the Soviet Union and the end of the Cold War in my book titled 1991, How Narasimha Rao Made History. The combination of circumstances that define 1991 forced the government to take a more comprehensive view of economic and defense capabilities and the dynamics of external economic and security relationships. As the decade progressed, the challenges posed by attempts to tweak the global nuclear order with changes to the non-proliferation treaty and the multilateral economic institutions brought the interface between economic power and national power to the fore in policy thinking in India. Prime Minister Narasimha Rao's decision in 1995 to postpone nuclear tests and Prime Minister Atal Bihari Vajpayee's decision to in fact conduct them in 1998 were both influenced by the views of the economic policy managers at that time, especially in the Union Finance Ministry and the Reserve Bank of India. It is only when the rate of growth of national income picked up uh, in the period 1980 to 2000 and particularly after 1990, going up from an annual rate of 3.5% in the first 30 years, uh, which is 50 to 80, to an average of 5.5% in the second phase, which is 80 to 2000, the economy yielded the required revenues for allocation to defense and strategic programs. I recall during the nuclear deal debate in 2005-2006, uh, the debate on the Indo-US nuclear deal, some scientists at the Department of, uh, of Atomic Energy complaining at that time that Manmohan Singh was opposed to India's nuclear program, which is why I had starved it of funds as finance minister in the early 90s. The fact of the matter is that the funds were simply not available in the early 90s for defense or for the strategic program. And it was the acceleration of economic growth in the early 2000s, since the early 2000s, that enabled the government to increase these allocations. The Kargil War showed for the first time that the Indian economy was able to absorb the costs of war better than Pakistan. The fact is that till the 1980s, the Pakistan economy was on a surer footing, both in terms of foreign exchange reserves and state fiscal capacity than India. We should never forget that in the 1960s and 70s, 65 war and 71 war, Pakistan was economy was in fact in a stronger position to handle the consequences of those wars uh, than the Indian economy. <clears throat> the Kargil, uh, sorry, um, it was only in the 1990s that the Indian economy outpaced Pakistan. India was also able to absorb the impact of economic sanctions imposed after 1998 nuclear tests. I think Dr. Kelkar was at that time the finance secretary when we launched the resurgent India bonds and took several measures uh, to uh, you know, bolster our foreign exchange reserves in response to the uh, sanctions imposed by the United States, uh, Japan and other countries. Apart from the acceleration of private investment, foreign trade and economic growth, that the reforms of 1991 triggered, the decade ended with global attention also being drawn to India's newly acquired capabilities in the knowledge economy. The Y2K episode and the boom in information technology and IT enabled services changed Western, especially American perceptions about India. And the G7 economies began adopting a more supportive attitude towards India. This internal dynamism drew Western attention to India's strategic potential, both as a market and as a balancer to China. It is India's economic rise in the 1990s that Condoleezza Rice took note of in a famous essay that was published in the Foreign Affairs magazine in 2000 uh, and a note uh, that was submitted to President Bush during his campaign in which she urged the United States to view India as a neighbor of China rather than merely 
as a neighbor of Pakistan. This whole focus uh, that in, uh, looking at India only in terms of the India-Pakistan equation to looking at India in terms of the India-China equation, which begins with you know Condi Rice's paper and George Bush's uh, you know ch changed approach to India, uh, was really triggered in my judgment by the kind of uh, economic uh, you know resurgence in India, the IT uh, revolution. I recall in 2000 I spent a month at the East-West Center in Hawaii. Uh, where I wrote a paper on the role of IT uh, in changing U.S. perceptions about India and U.S. approach towards India. And I think there's a lot of data to support that uh, hypothesis even today. In, in December 1999, Prime Minister Vajpayee constituted the first National Security Advisory Board under the chairmanship of Sri K. Subramanian. In a diverse group of retired diplomats and officials, former service chiefs, nuclear scientists, intelligence czars, and strategic affairs analysts, the economist Rakesh Mohan, who was then Deputy Governor of the Reserve Bank of India, and I were also admitted. In one meeting, when I suggested that China would pose an economic challenge for India, long before it posed a military challenge, and drew attention to the concept of comprehensive national power, developed by scholars at the China Academy of Social Sciences. My views were dismissed by some of by some of the senior members of the SAB, who refused to believe at that time that China would emerge as a geoeconomic challenge for India. Mr. Subramanian then asked me to write a note for the NSAB on what I had said in that meeting. The note that has subsequently been published was titled the strategic consequences of India's economic performance. <clears throat> the note drew attention to the constraints posed by India's economic and fiscal capacity and capability in addressing the requirements of national security and defense. More importantly, it drew attention to the need for investment in human capability education, research and development, and science and technology in making the manufacturing sector globally competitive in order to address the strategic challenge that would be posed by China's impressive economic rise. Indeed, the concept of comprehensive national power emphasized the relevance of human capital and investment in science and technology to national power. We argued that it is not economic growth in itself that holds the key to India's global profile and power and its strategic role and relevance or its national security. But that nature of that growth process and the manner in which the economic challenges it faces today are addressed are vital to our ability to address these challenges. By nature, we meant the distributional aspects of growth the impact of growth on global competitiveness and integration with the global economy, and the sectoral composition of that growth, that is the extent of industrialization and its fiscal sustainability. We said this was relevant because India's bigger security challenge in its journey to major power status is largely internal, both economic and political. India's primary external challenge at that time was posed by cross-border terrorism in the northwestern region bordering Pakistan. This, can, this problem cannot be addressed, we felt, without dealing with its domestic counterpart, which feeds on social and economic backwardness of the minorities and communal and caste tensions at home. The note took the view that 5.5% annual rate of GDP growth registered during the period 1980 to 2000 would be inadequate to simultaneously address the challenge of development and national security and the external challenge posed by China's rise. We suggested that an annual rate of growth of at least 7 to 8% was the minimum required to generate fiscal resources required to address India's developmental and strategic challenges. The strategic consequences of the economic competition with China are, we suggested in that note, fundamental to India's future role within Asia and the global system. 
if India can sustain above average growth, by which we meant about 7% growth uh, in the subsequent decade, and if China experiences a deceleration of growth, coupled with domestic political uncertainty, the widening gap between the two civilizational neighbors can be reversed to an extent. Uh, as we know, uh, our growth did accelerate, you know, China kept up its momentum and, and therefore the, the gap did not actually uh, reduce. If this did not happen, we concluded, and I quote from, from that paper, China will emerge as the preeminent Asian power and force India into accepting its strategic leadership even within South Asia. The key to this strat strategic rivalry will be the relative economic performance of the two countries. The main strategic challenge for India in the medium term is therefore its relative economic performance vis-a-vis -vis China." Unquote. Permit me to remind all of you that this note was written 22 years ago in the year 2000. Emphasizing the critical importance of bolstering the fiscal capacity and capability of the state to national security and development planning, the note observed that medium-term fiscal threats facing the economy arose from an inability to finance essential development expenditure and to ensure a truly efficient financial system. Productive investment was being held back by the inability to reduce unproductive subsidies, mobilize adequate direct tax revenues, and generate returns to existing public investment. These systemic weaknesses increase the vulnerability to external economic pressures. In making the transition to major power status, India will have to find resources for national defense and military capacity building. Higher economic growth as well as political and military strength cannot be achieved without a major program of fiscal regeneration at both the level of the union government and the states. Our note then outlined what we regarded as principles of sound macroeconomic management from a national security perspective. These being, one, elimination of revenue deficits and manageable fiscal deficit. Elimination of wasteful subsidies that are not targeted to the poor. Low and manageable current account deficit. Low internal and external debt. Low short-term debt in overall external debt. And this was a significant point considering that in 1991, one of the major factors was the high level of short-term debt. Profit generation by public enterprises. Privatization of non-strategic public enterprises. Increasing share of manufacture and national income to at least 20% with indigenization of defense equipment manufacturing. Public utilities like power, irrigation water, and public transport should be priced economically. And an increase in the tax GDP ratio to levels reached by rapidly industrializing developing countries of around 15% of GDP from the then low rate of 9% of GDP. Do remember and I keep <laughs> emphasizing this, that this was all written in 2000. <clears throat> Each of these objectives and principles of macroeconomic policy would hold true even today. Indeed, reading some recent studies of the balance of power between India and China and suggestions to the effect that India must accelerate economic growth and build comprehensive national power, only remind me of what we said two decades ago. In these two decades, the economic differential between China and India has only become even more skewed in China's favor. In 2000, in the year 2000, the ratio of India's GDP to that of China was 1 is to 2 in PPP terms and 1 is to 3 in US dollar terms uh, at the prices of 2015, dollar price of 2015. By 2020, these ratios uh, changed to 1 is to 4.5 uh, for PPP national income and 1 is to 5.8 for GDP valued in dollars um, in 2015 prices. China's economy took off during the period 2000 to 2020 in a manner that has fundamentally altered the strategic balance, not just in Asia, 
but across the world. China today has emerged as a superpower uh, in a league of its own along with the United States. While India recorded an impressive 7.4% annual GDP growth during 2001 to 13, registering an all-time high of 8.8% in 2005 to 11, it has since not been able to sustain this rate. Over the past five years, the economy has further slowed down, with the last three years recording a mere 3.8% rate of growth. One immediate consequence of this slowdown has been a reduction in budgetary allocations for defense. The share of defense services, budgets in central government expenditure has come down from an average of 15.3% in 2004-07 to 9.7% in 2020-23, the budget estimate, latest budget estimate. Today, when defense and strategic policy analysts draw attention to the challenge posed by China's rise, there is, of course, greater recognition of the importance of economic capability and fiscal capability in dealing with this challenge. Be it building bigger maritime capability, better capabilities along the border, or reducing dependence on export, or oh, sorry, on imports of critical goods and technologies from China. Each of these challenges requires increased fiscal capacity of the state and a strategic allocation of resources aimed at boosting comprehensive national power. Initiatives like production-linked li incentives for promoting domestic manufacture, which have recently been launched by the government for about 12 or 13 industries, are sustainable only if the fiscal capacity of the state is further bolstered. Recognizing the strategic importance of state support for development and defense against the background of fiscal and external pressures, the Union Ministry of Finance published a paper in 2011 constructing what was then called an index of government economic power. This was against the background of the 2008-2009 transatlantic financial crisis and the problems that, po that uh, it posed uh, to India. The paper noted that the global economic crisis, which is the transatlantic financial crisis of 2008-2009, witnessed governments playing a crucial role in stabilizing financial markets and managing to coordinate responses in order to prop up the world economy. In the wake of the crisis, governments continue to play a vital role in terms of economic management and welfare-oriented activities. Now, this is a quote from that note. Governments also play a critical role as agents of redistributive equity and development. Therefore, the economic power of governments is a matter of great significance." Unquote. While the paper did not explicitly refer to spending on defense, the foundation of what is called government economic power is, of course, the fiscal capacity of the state. It was Kautilya who observed centuries ago that it is on the strength of the treasury, and that's the phrase, that a nation's security depends. I would wager to add that by the term treasury, Kautilya was not just alluding to the state's fiscal capacity, but also the overall health of the economy on which that fiscal capacity is dependent, the which includes a manufacturing base, an agricultural base, and global competitiveness. It is the improvement in India's economic indices in 2003-11, especially the rate of growth of GDP, the rate of gross fixed capital formation, savings rate, share of exports and national income, and stable current account and fiscal deficits, as well as the decline in poverty that shaped a geopolitical reassessment of India. India was viewed as a rising power and was invited to join the Group of 20 summit in 2008, despite having by far the lowest GDP per capita among major economies. I should add here an anecdote. Uh, since we are now uh, chair of the G20 and we going to host G20. G20 came about in 2000, Nicolas Cozy, the president of France, rushed to meet George Bush 
uh, in the context of the transatlantic financial crisis and uh, said him that unless we uh, bring China on board, it would not be possible for us to deal with the crisis, given China's enormous uh, leverage with Western economies. And the suggestion was, why don't we bring in China into the G7? Yeah, if you recall, Russia was part of the G7, it became G8, and Russia was part of the G8, and the G7 went back to G7. And, and, and the G7 countries, particularly the United States, were not willing to bring in China into a new G8. And it was then that the two decided at Camp David uh, to elevate the finance minister's group 20, it was the finance minister's group, to a summit level. And that is how the G20 was created. And India's admission into that was essentially a product of the West's unwillingness to bring only China on board. So they brought the entire G20 on board. And the fact is that if you look at the G20 today, India has the lowest per capita income. And yet we are there for, in my judgment, essentially geopolitics. This geopolitical readjustment of India, as evidenced by many Western studies of India at that time, was partly based on India's improved economic performance. However, India's continued rise was contingent upon three important economic values. The modernization of its base, improvements in labor and capital productivity, enabling the manufacturing and agricultural sectors to become more globally competitive, and fiscal sustainability of government's activities. The National Manufacturing Competitiveness Council of, set up in 2006 by Prime Minister Manmohan Singh drafted what came to be called a Make in India strategy aimed at achieving the first two objectives of, of uh, you know, building a modernization of the industrial base uh, and improvements in labor and capital productivity. And the fiscal responsibility and budget in 2003 uh, was aimed at strengthening the fiscal capacity of the state. Over the past decade, from 2012 to 2022, there has been a gradual deceleration of investment rate and consequently of the growth rate. India's share of world exports has declined, exerting pressure on balance of payments and also on the rupee. There has been a worsening of the combined fiscal deficit of the union and state governments. The share of manufacturing and national income has remained stagnant at 17%, despite all the brouhaha about Make in India and Atman in Bharata. More recently, unemployment rate has gone up and the average rate of inflation has also trended upwards. Not surprisingly, the fiscal allocation for defense services has gone down. While China too has faltered on the economic front, the economic gap between China and India remains wide and there is as yet little evidence to indicate any convergence between the two. China remains engaged with the global economy and is rapidly emerging as a knowledge and technology power. India has raised tariffs, opted out of all plurilateral trade agreements, is, and is as yet unable to secure FTAs with the US, the European Union, and the UK. Though recently we have uh, signed, uh, we have succeeded in having a FTA with Australia and we are negotiating one with the GCC countries. Clearly, domestic economic constraints have once again begun to restrict India's global choices. The question for policymakers is whether the power gap, howsoever measured, between India and China is lesser today than in 2000 or greater today. And if it is indeed greater today, then that is to be asked a growth process over the last two decades, the policy, policy choices we have made and the challenges that this pose for us. As we survey the world today, it is evident that the global environment is less conducive to India's economic rise than at any other time in the past two decades. I recall Dr. Manmohan Singh often making the point that the objective of Indian foreign policy is to create a global environment conducive to India's economic rise. This was a phrase that was read, often used. But I would uh, wager to add that today the global environment, for a variety of reasons, including the recent war in Ukraine, 
uh, has become less conducive to India's economic rise. Phenomenon of deglobalization, of trade wars between major powers, major economies, uh, new technology denial regimes have created new barriers to growth. On the other hand, India's external dependence in terms of dependence on imported oil, imported energy, uh, technology, including chips, and export of manpower, uh, which has become an important source of foreign exchange reserves, have only grown in this period. I have a book recently published called India's Power Elite, in which I look at the phenomenon called the secession of the successful, which is the growing my out-migration of India's uh, upper middle class, of India's uh, better educated, uh, of India's business. Uh, there is a out of talent, of wealth that has been happening and accelerating. And I've given some data on that in that book. Within this challenging external context, India's domestic economic slowdown would, of course, have strategic consequences. Despite taking geopolitical initiatives such as Quad and establishing closer defense and strategic partnerships with the United States, Japan, and other Western powers, China's comprehensive national power imparts to it a leverage in international affairs that still eludes India. The recent G7 outreach to China is a sobering reminder. Look at the fact that the first visitor to Beijing after Xi Jinping's uh, you know, new term in his new term was the Prime Minister of Pakistan, followed immediately by the Chancellor of Germany. And the French and the Germans and the Europeans are once again wooing uh, Beijing and President Biden and Xi had a, 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 an exchange in Bali, which should, uh, you know, uh, wake us up to the, the, the kind of uh, interdependence that China has been able to establish with the West. Improving the course of economic performance and managing the strategic consequences of the recent slowdown and persistent weakness with respect to global competitiveness and domestic enterprise, constitute an important national security challenge. Returning to the path of 8%, improving fiscal parameters and making the economy globally more competitive remain as much a challenge today as they did in the year 2000. The stated policy of Atmanirbhar Bharat Abhyan is a welcome initiative. By However, it requires a medium-term comprehensive plan within which fiscal policy, industrial development, foreign trade policy, human capital formation, and science and technology development are set out. While the government may be fighting shy of returning to the era of five-year plans, have shut down the planning community. Indian economy requires a five-year plan arrived at consensually between the governments of the union and the states to pursue strategic economic policy aimed at bolstering India's comprehensive national power. Thank you very much for your patience and wish you all a good evening. Thank you. You will agree, ladies and gentlemen, that it was a very impressive talk. And frankly, I, I would urge you to find echoes of this in tomorrow's deliberations. Um, in fact, the theme that uh, was chosen for this year's PDNS was India's security in the changing world environment. And when we are talking about the changing world environment, a large part of that environment has to do with economy. And therefore, it couldn't have, uh, we couldn't have had a, a better person to set the perspective uh, of the economic performance and what uh, what it means for our future, particularly as it affects our security, um, I think uh, we we had the right person to to put it across to us. Thank you very much. Um, I know many of you have had long journeys to arrive here. I sincerely hope you're reasonably comfortable in your uh, in your accommodation that we've been able to arrange for you. And uh, look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Dinner's uh, served already, but you can have it at your, at your convenience. Um, you can carry on, uh, you know, uh, 
re-establishing your old contacts because as you all walked in, number of you, uh, I could see that uh, you were recounting the times when you had last met and some of them go back uh, many, many years. So please uh, continue to enjoy the evening. Thank you very much. See you tomorrow early morning. Jai Hind.